Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to this, our worship for what is already the fourth Sunday in Lent here at the First Congregational Church of Sutton. We're glad to see each one of you who is safe to make it here to join with us as we take good care of one another. We thank God that we have the technology to have a a video prepared later on today so that folks will be joining us throughout the course of the week, either on YouTube or through cable television. So if you know someone that might not be on the Facebook page or get the link otherwise, give them a holler. And of course, they can get it from the church office to get to the YouTube link or to know which. I forget the channel numbers and times, but folks in the office know which ones on local cable are available as well. I draw your attention to the insert in the bulletin about ordering Easter flowers, lilies, or tulips. Uh, The orders need to be in by uh, next Sunday, March 21st. And I'm going to reach out a little bit and assume that if you gave a call to the office, Marie would take an order over the phone too, and you can send in a check to pay for the flowers. If that's not true, Marie will let me know later. We have a wonderful relationship, my sister and I, and, uh, but I'm going to reach out and figure she can probably do that for you. We, were, we also have, uh, just about have prepared a schedule for Holy Week from Palm Sunday through Monday, Thursday through Good Friday to Easter Sunday, including we are going to have the Easter sunrise service again over on the common at 6.30. We'll pray it's not too chilly that morning, uh, but we're having it right a few minutes after sunrise, so we know we'll be able to see the music. Uh, Are there any other announcements for the congregation this morning? Am I missing anything? Yes, Linda. I'll echo that for the sake of the microphone, that during the month of March, the Missions Committee is looking to collect food to support walking and light ministry. We have the uh, yellow box with the yellow lid by the church office doors. In particular, they need to get stocked up on pasta, rice, cereal, and the the canned fruit that's canned in syrup. Um, Those are the ones in particular that will add to the, the thin spots in the stockage in the walking and light food pantry. So if you pay attention to that as you go by the church, it only takes a minute, stop by and put something in the box. Thank you. Any other announcements? Nope. Then it is that point where, again, instead of the the happy mixing around and greeting of folks, we're going to throw a wave, a smile, throw a kiss or a hug at somebody, especially if you haven't seen them for a while or haven't seen them before. Everybody is grinning behind the mask, whether you are or not, we'll assume you are. And we'll throw a hug to folks at home to share there in your households. Take a hug home with you for folks in your households as is safe and appropriate. We invite you to rise as you are able to join in our call to worship. Taken this morning from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered from in the lands. From the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. Then they cried to, uh, to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved for them from their distress. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful get, um, works to the mankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and the deeds of the sons Please join us in verses 1 and 3 of Lift High the Cross on the insert.
invite you to join me in our prayer of invocation. O Almighty God, from whom every good gift comes and who pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication, deliver us when we draw near to you from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The assurance of forgiveness slipped into the bulletin where it usually belongs after a prayer of confession. But it doesn't hurt to hear it. There is no condemnation now, says the Lord, for those who are in Christ Jesus who endeavor to live according to the Spirit and according to the flesh. For as the Apostle John reminds us, God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Now for the young folks, you can't help but have noticed if if you have ventured out into a grocery store, department store, anywhere, that for some weeks now, there's been all kinds of stuff in the seasonal aisle with shamrocks and green hats and and green necklaces and and, and green glasses and all leprechauns and everything else about happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm told we make a bigger deal out of St. Patrick's Day in America than the Irish do in Ireland. They celebrate, but we go a little nutty here probably so we can sell all those green things in the gift shops or grocery stores, department stores. Well, there was a real St. Patrick, a missionary to Ireland, back in the 5th century. By the way, my, my father, myself, and my son all bear the middle name Patrick. Even though there's not much Irish truly in us, we, we bear the name anyway. And Patrick, I think his name was actually Maywin. Uh, it was an old uh, Celtic British Roman name. Was a, a young man growing up in, in England, which was part of the Roman Empire at the time. And Irish raiders, when he was 16, kidnapped him from his family. Took him to Ireland, where they made him a slave. And they gave him next to nothing to eat. They gave him very little in way of any kind of new clothing to wear. They put him out in the wilderness tending sheep most of the time all by himself. He was cold, he was hungry, he was frightened. And while his family was Christian, they weren't, I don't know, today we'd say real church going folks. It wasn't a central part of their lives. But for Patrick in those dark, frightening nights alone, it became his life, his life in God. And one dark night while he was praying, God said to him in a, a dream or a vision or something, Patrick, your boat's ready. And he walked 200 miles to the coast under God's guidance. And sure enough, there was a ship willing to give him passage back to England. When he got to England and he got clothed and fattened up a little bit, he got another message from God that said, I want you to take me and my son, take the Christ, back to the Irish. Well, he started a long study. I think he spent 15 years studying until he became a bishop, an overseer of other pastors in the church. He went back to Ireland. Now, he went to minister to those Christians who were already in Ireland. There were some there. And he went to give them comfort, to give them teaching, to help develop leadership for them. But he also went to these little Irish kings in the wilderness. And they were some pretty barbaric people. It took some courage to go back to the same people who had kidnapped and enslaved him, but he did. And Ireland became a country that had many monasteries and places of study of faith. And during the Middle Ages, when a lot of faith was lost, in some places in Ireland it was kept and stored and saved. You'll see a lot of shamrocks. It's a four-leaf clover somebody messed up because it really only has three leaves. 
a little bit like a clover. And these shamrocks are, are native to Ireland, very green. I've got one in the living room, but I didn't think it would make the trip in the car very safely. And it has three leaves. Patrick used this as a symbol. And the reason we see it so much now, the story is that Patrick used that as a symbol to try to explain the Trinity to people who were new Christians. That we only have one God, one shamrock. Three leaves, three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he pointed to what he said, is that leaf this leaf? No. Is the middle leaf either of those two? No. Separate leaves, yes. But is it all shamrock? Yes. We have the Father. We have the Son, we have the Spirit, and neither person is the other. But are they all one God? Are they all one substance? Yes. So even when you look at the shamrock and all these Irish decorations for, for St. Patrick's Day, remember, Patrick was a teacher of the love of Jesus Christ to many, many people. So we can look at all the, the hoopla and the green and the noise and remember a teacher of Christ. So we give thanks to God for Patrick of Ireland. Thank you.
God's people at it. Amen. Thank you. Time has come when we gather our greatest thanks for our blessings, our greatest cares and concerns to share together at the foot of God's mercy seat as his people. We keep Patty Lyon and her family in our prayers for the loss of her father, David Graves, about a week and a half ago, and pray that the the comfort will come from the fulfillment of the promises of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that the void of grief will be softened at the edges and in time filled in by the memories of love and life shared. We also keep in our prayers Anne and Clark, Janice, Carolyn. As always, our community, our commonwealth, our, our nation and the world, our first responders, all who ride out to keep us in peace and safety locally. Those who serve in distant lands, often at risk to themselves for the sake of liberty and peace for all peoples, especially right now children and their teachers, that the various forms of teaching that we are using are going to be effective and good for the children and not wearing out our teachers and that we get safely back to being in one another's presence, not just in school, but in a lot of settings, including right here, of course. And all who are grieving and ill, lost and lonely in so many ways. Lord, we ask your blessing on our our church and our ministry together. Are there any other special blessings or, or cares that we need to lift this morning together in prayer? I do have one other that's half Thanksgiving and half care. Kathy and our daughter Mary arrived safely in North Carolina to visit my mother-in-law, who is overjoyed at seeing them. And my sister-in-law and her husband get a little break from being caregivers for mother-in-law. So that works out all around. The Germans have an expression, one hand washes the other. They're taking care of each other that way. Any other special blessings or thanks to give this morning? Let us join then our our hearts and minds to come to the foot of God's mercy seat together in prayer. Heavenly Father, eternal creator in the heavens, merciful, gracious, forgiving Father in our lives, you who come to us as Jesus Christ, Lord, Savior, Redeemer, you who continue your presence with us as Holy Spirit, wind and fire of the church, giver of gifts to the believers to serve one another, Lord in all persons, thank you for the ways in which you enrich and bestow on our lives. We do ask your care for the family of David Graves and all who are in times of grief and loss. Remind us that grief is your way of reminding us of how much we've had to love and how much our lives can mean to one another. Watch over those we love who who are traveling. If they arrive safely and return safely and that the visits are good for one another. Watch over this household of faith, gracious God, and your church in all places. Give us continuing faith and courage to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in its full glory. And we ask especially your courage and strength and endurance for the church in places where they cannot do so easily or safely. Oh, Lord, we pray, care for them. For all who lay down parts of their lives and risk laying all of their lives down. For our peace, for our safety, for our care, our wellness, our liberty. Oh, Lord, guide them and guard them 
make them swift and skilled in the work that they do. And from every call, from every mission, bring them home safely, we pray. Grant wisdom. Grant empathy. Grant insight. To all who make and enforce decisions, Father. From our congregation to our community, to our commonwealth, to our nation. Let not the foolish lust for power overcome your word, your will, and your way for how you call us to reflect your glory and the care that we give to one another. We lift all our prayers, Heavenly Father, in loving trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray together as he has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time when we invite one another to share the blessings that God has shared with us, that through our church we can put them to use, put them to good work, put them to God's purposes. There's a plate in the narthex if you brought a gift in person. The mailing address is on the bulletin. and On the website we have a link for online giving if you're comfortable with that. Lord, bless the givers in the giving. Bless the gifts in their using. Use us all in the work of our hands to reflect your glory throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We invite you to rise as you are able for the first two verses of Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
Please be seated. The first scripture lesson from today comes from Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea and to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water, and we loathe the worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he might take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, um, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. Uh, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. The second reading comes from uh, John. Chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does not does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. May God bless our hearing and understanding of this word. Thank you, Brian. One scholar who, who wrote about the gospel according to John said that at this passage, John referred to a bizarre story from the Old Testament. And of all the stories of, of God rescuing the people from slavery in Egypt, this is one of the stranger ones, isn't it? Now, it bears saying a little bit of the setting. They're taking a, a bit of a detour to avoid the land of Edom. What's Edom then, a place on the map? Well, actually, Edom is the land of uh, when uh, Jacob cheated his brother. His brother's name was Edom, redhead. So uh, this is going around a, a place where their cousins don't like them very well. And they're stuck on a diet. Now, if you can imagine a bread that is so strange, you called it, what is it? You wonder what it is, so maybe we could call it Wonder Bread. The first bird colonel I ever worked for was named Harlan B. Sanders. So the main course, maybe, these quails in the evening, maybe that was Kentucky Fried Chicken. So if you're on a diet of Wonder Bread and KFC, you get tired of it. You don't have to work for it, you just have to gather it. And it is sustaining you through years in the wilderness where you have to wander and you can't farm. Human nature being what it is, do you think we start to bellyache a little? We're stuck with Wonder Bread and KFC, even if we didn't have to work for it. Well, they did. 
They start to bellyache. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and water, and we loathe this worthless food. Manna from heaven and quails that land for the taking? We loathe this worthless food, parentheses, from God. Yikes. So God says, I'm going to teach him to count on me again. So he sends fiery serpents of some sort, poisonous snakes. People died when they were bitten, and they cried out, we get it, Moses. You'll have to pray for us because God isn't listening to us. We've, we've angered him too much. Pray that God will save us. God says to Moses, not that easy. Make a bronze serpent, a shiny one, they can see. Put it on a staff and hold it up in front of the people. If they're bitten, they look to a symbol of my healing. Not to believe on the serpent, but to believe on me, says God. There will be a symbol by which I'll heal them. And sure enough, those who were bitten, instead of stomping on the serpent and looking down at the wound and crying out, looked to God's symbol of healing, were healed of snake bite. Well, we know that now, chemically and, and medically, from snake venom, we can make anti-venom, the antidote to snake bite. And there are other medications and cures over many years that have come out of snake venom. This is an ancient, ancient story song. I, I, Buchanan's an amateur at this, but I think the Greeks copied the symbol for their symbol of healing, their god of healing, Esculapius. And I hate to admit that it's the fault of the army that the medical symbol is the pair of wings, the staff with the wings and two snakes. That's actually the messenger god's staff, Hermes, later Mercury. The proper staff is on our EMT symbols, where you see a staff with a single snake. And that is the staff of the Dr. Esculapius, whose name used to be included in the old version of the Hippocratic Oath for physicians and medical caregivers. That's the symbol to this day. And people who look at symbols say, oh, yes, that's Esculapius. Look a little back in your history. That's the symbol of God's healing, even on our EMT patches to this day. And I think because the wings look cool and symmetrical, the, at least the Army Medical Corps and, and many medical symbols still keep that two-winged one, even if it's kind of the wrong staff. We won't tell them. Please, if they watch the video, forgive me. God raised up a symbol in the hand of Moses to look to my symbol, look to my healing, and live. John refers back to that, gives it a purpose, and says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, and this is just before the quote that winds up on all the signs at baseball games, John 3.16. Just before that, he says, the, the Son of Man must be lifted up, a double meaning even in Greek as it is in English. The Son of Man must be lifted up so that those of us whose lives are snake bit, I think it's an old American West term for someone of, of bad luck or cursed, those of us who are snake bit by sin may look to the cross, a symbol of curse in Hebrew tradition. May look to the one who hangs there, and, and we as congregationalists don't only hung crosses in recent centuries, and it's an Easter cross. But we are told to look by John to the Good Friday cross, to look to the Christ on the cross as the Israelites in the wilderness had to look to the serpent on the staff because we too are snake bit by sin and must look to the Christ raised on the cross as a symbol of our redemption, of our healing, of our salvation from snake bite of sin. Because remember that one of the earliest symbols of Satan in the Bible is what? A serpent. A poisonous snake 
who whispered poison into the ears of Adam and Eve. But to be lifted up also means to be exalted. To be put, that's the one who belongs on a pedestal in our lives, no one else, only God. And God in Jesus Christ, lifted high and exalted as our Savior, as a central symbol of our faith whose gospel is the heart of our faith and teaching when we remain true. I know I've given you another symbol besides the staff with a serpent or the, the patch on an EMT sleeve. And that was uh, worship when I was a cadet. I experienced kind of Episcopal style worship. The cadet chapel was then anyway, a little bit high church in style. And when we marched in in the choir, when I first sang in the choir, it was all guys who didn't have women cadets yet. Four across and 12 deep in our dressiest uniforms. We had a crucifer, a cross bearer, at the head of the procession. And he was always a sophomore. They didn't trust a plebe, a first year cadet to carry it. And it was always the tallest one we had in the choir. And they'd go recruit one, even if his voice wasn't great, if he was about 6'4 or more. He was the crucifer. Here he is in his 44 brass buttons and his red sash. Now that staff is what, seven or eight feet tall for a nice one? Eric is more familiar with him than I am. That was my really only my common, my regular experience at worship with him. Well, this six and a half foot tall cadet doesn't hold it by the middle like a nice little acolyte does. He grabs it by the base of the staff and puts it up about 12, 14 feet in the air. And as the choir processes down the aisle, the congregation doesn't start singing until that cross is next to them. And when we sang, lift high the cross, and the largest church pipe organ in the world cut loose a little bit to shake the stones, I felt like we were exalting Christ, at least as, as liturgically or symbolically as we could in worship. To lift high the cross and look to our Lord and Redeemer to heal us from the snake bite of sin. Wow. I hope that image of Christ lifted on the cross, first as the curse for our sake, but then eternally in glory, in the empty Easter cross, and Christ exalted to the right hand of God the Father in heaven. That is a symbol to which we look to be healed of the worldly snake bite of sin. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. I invite you to rise and sing together one more time the first two verses of I Cannot Tell. I know it's a longish one, it goes two pages, but I had to get an Irish flavor in here somewhere.
grace, love, and peace to you. In the name of God, our Father, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen.